loud. Hi everyone, I'm Donna Hartland, the Executive Director of the GBS CIDP Foundation of Canada. We're excited to have this edition of the Ask the Expert with our Medical Advisory Board, Dr. Hans Katzberg, which is part of the University Health Network, Toronto Western Hospital, and the Prosserman Neuromuscular uh, Diseases uh, Clinic. And uh, he's here to help us out with uh, issues and vaccinations, in particular, uh, some information with our conditions. And we thank you very much, Dr. Katzberg, for taking this time out to help our patients. Thank you, Donna, and thank you for the GBS uh, CIDP Foundation for the invitation. Uh, as Donna mentioned, uh, we'll be talking about vaccine-related issues in immune neuropathies in particular, how does it apply to CIDP, GBS, and MMN. Uh, this was uh, a talk that I gave during the, one of the national meetings last year. It was important back then, and it certainly is ever more important now uh, as we are tackling with COVID uh, on many levels. So we're happy to have this uh, talk uh, once again. Uh, some of the objectives will be to uh, talk a little bit about the background related to vaccinations as it will put the rest of the discussion in context, um, a little bit about the vaccines and the risk of either developing or worsening GBS, CIDP, MMN. This is top of mind for many patients. Um, also, someone in particular with CIDP is re receiving chronic immunotherapy, uh, how are vaccines dealt with it then? And then finally, we'll end up with some other practical considerations and questions. And there were some questions that came in either uh, already in anticipation of this talk. So I've made sure I tried to address as many questions as possible through the talk. And uh, as always, happy to receive any queries uh, after the talk as well through the foundation. Uh, here are my disclosures, including the commercial disclosures. There's nothing relevant for this talk, but I should also highlight that all these um, concepts are general concepts and every patient is different. So we can give general uh, principles, uh, recommendations. However, it's quite important to consult your own physician for specific advice about your own medical condition. So a little bit about uh, background and history, uh, inoculation is a concept by, by which um, live pathogens, uh, so either bacteria or viruses, are used to develop immunity in a host. This is mentioned as early as perhaps the 10th century. And then in the 18th century, um, smallpox was decided on one of the um, very uh, virulent pathogens that was aimed to be tackled with some of these concepts. So this was smallpox, which was responsible for up to 20% of deaths in some countries. And a big breakthrough uh, in the 18th century was that uh, uh, cowpox is a uh, uh, pathogen that was found to be very similar to smallpox, uh, and, but did not cause disease in humans, but could be used to develop protection, uh, immune protection against actual smallpox. And these concepts were then furthered by Louis Pasteur in, um, in France in the 1800s, and, and that's when vaccines uh, really took off uh, as we know them today. What about the mechanism and biology? How do vaccines work? So as I mentioned, the concept is to work with the body's natural defenses to develop immunity to a disease. So either a weakened or killed form of the disease, virus or bacteria is injected in the body. The body then creates antibodies to fight against these germs. And once someone is actually exposed to this virus or bacteria, then uh, the antibodies can return because they are present in order to fight uh, the virus or bacteria. And the other uh, concept on the right here is that of herd immunity. You may have heard a lot about that in the news in recent months uh, and similar graphics. And here's how it works. Uh, healthy people in the light blue in the top uh, panel here. And once someone gets sick, highlighted in the red, uh, depending on how virulent it is, um, how infectious this agent is, it could spread rapidly uh, or aggressively in the community, as you can see in red here. If a few people are vaccinated, immunized uh, against the agent, but does not reach a certain threshold, then that virus or bacteria can still spread, as can be seen here on the red. Um, uh, uh, people here on the right. However, if enough people are vaccinated and it reaches a certain threshold known as herd immunity, uh, then then that will prevent the spread of the bacteria or virus. So enough people have to be vaccinated. That's why you see and hear so much about this. 
uh, because it's not enough for just a few people to be vaccinated in order to protect the community as a whole uh, from these agents. So what are the benefits of vaccination? Well, it has the ability to reduce uh, the disease, so actually catching it. Uh, if someone catches it, perhaps it can reduce the, how, the disability, how strongly someone is affected by it, because they do have some immunity against it. And on the serious end, uh, it can prevent uh, death in some viruses and bacteria where the mortality rate is very high. Um, and the goal ultimately is eradication to prevent these conditions or diseases from, uh, from spreading or, uh, or becoming at all prevalent in the population. So vaccines uh, naturally can be administered to children and adults. Uh, so it's not just for children and it's not just for adults either. And they can offer lifelong protection in some cases. And in some cases there's boosters that are needed to optimize the vaccines if the immunity weakens over time. So every vaccine really is different. And that's the reason I think now during the pandemic, you're hearing a lot of work and details being uh, examined um, because in fact, uh, once each vaccine is developed, they act uh, differently and independently, perhaps even from different uh, makers of the vaccine. Uh, so paying close attention to those details are important and are still yet to be available for COVID-19 as these uh, vaccines are being developed. What are some challenges? The vaccines may not be available everywhere in the world, particularly in low-income countries or places where it's difficult to access the whole population due to geography, for example. Um, but uh, many times they can be administered relatively easily. So there's different ways to administer vaccines. Some are oral by mouth, some are injections, uh, intramuscular. Uh, but the goal is always to have an overall good safety profile um, because of the fact is that the vaccines themselves should uh, have low or, or no virulence or um, sort of effects on patients. So that's what everyone's paying attention always, uh, first and foremost, when vaccines are being developed. So here's an example of smallpox. I made that example early, one of the first diseases that was tackled. And you can see here the global number of reported smallpox cases as early as the 1920s, very active into the 30s, 40s. And as vaccine programs were being instituted, this really led to a decline in the number of cases leading to essentially eradication of this um, in the 1980s. So this is the benefits and the goals of all vaccination is to eliminate some of these very, very serious diseases worldwide. What about concerns? You've heard a lot about uh, concerns in the media uh, from people. Uh, so why is there this concern if, if the goal of vaccines is to protect health? Well, some patients have uh, difficulty tolerating the vaccines. So uh, it is true that there can be some rare allergies to the vaccine uh, and there can be some uh, rare instances where people react through an immune uh, mechanism uh, to these uh, vaccines in different ways or with someone that has a weakened immune system uh, and that can cause uh, disease or perhaps even uh, other unintended effects. So people are concerned about this uh, severe immune reactions themselves also have been reported. Uh, however, as I'll highlight shortly, uh, this is not the rule, this is the exceptions. Uh, and although they, they can occur, these are rare events. And the goal is always to have these to be at the minimum or non-existent if at all possible uh, in order to reap the very positive effects that can come from vaccines, which I'll go over as well. Some other objective objections people, um, have some personal beliefs against vaccination, perhaps even that they do not work. Because if the goal is to not have any disease, if it's not around, people often question that, you know, how do we know that it's actually doing anything, especially when disease rates are very low. When they're top of mind, like in COVID right, right now, um, I think we will do anything to kind of bring those numbers down. But when it's really at low levels, sometimes uh, people question these things. Um, the other uh, concerns perhaps uh, are government interference uh, and uh, corporate influence and profits from vaccines. So these are all valid questions that people have. And as mentioned, I'll try to address some of these medical questions throughout the talk. So before we go into some of those specifics, just how to categorize vaccines, um, it depends uh, on the formulation uh, of the agent itself. So some of the vaccines are um, made from live vaccine, uh, vaccine products, so live viruses, which are then what's called attenuated, meaning they're changed so that they don't have the virulent or disease-causing aspects. So some examples of these are tuberculosis, oral polio vaccines, measles, or yellow fever. Uh, 
but the majority of, of vaccines are actually not made with um, uh, actual viruses that are attenuated and live, but actually completely inactivated, as in certain vaccines, uh, whole pertussis and inactivated polio, or are made uh, from parts of the virus or bacteria, protein subunits, polysaccharides, which are sugars, um, a conjugate, which means some combination of uh, products, um, and uh, other similar subunits. And they're listed on the right here. So the majority of the vaccines are not what's called live attenuated vaccines, but they're made with some component of the agent. So what about vaccines and, G and GBS? Um, so one concern uh, that you might hear, and I'm going to mention it first, is that uh, perhaps vaccines uh, can cause GBS. This is something that uh, was observed uh, potentially back in the 1970s. Uh, and let me go into that in detail because there's a lot of un, uh, lack of clarity about these kind of topics. And I think this is one of the main uh, reasons that some of these uh, issues have been raised. Uh, and that's that in the 1970s, uh, there was a, a rate of uh, GBS occurring, uh, which was reported initially as about one to two in 100,000 in relation to the flu vaccine. Um, so this led to some concerns. Uh, there was also some concerns, uh, never substantiated, that perhaps neurological vaccines um, could have a higher chance of causing neurological problems. Uh, but really, this was not so. And um, the link between some vaccines and GBS actually were, were really very low or non-existent at all. So the flu vaccine, uh, I think, uh, was played a lot of attention to. And uh, this was a certain type of flu vaccine to a US swine flu influenza program. As I mentioned, about one in 100,000, that was noticed in some army, army uh, recruits and uh, trainees. Uh, and this then led to a lot of very close epidemiological um, uh, attention paid to this to really determine, is this a real link, this uh, flu vaccine? Does it really cause GBS at this rate of one in 100,000. Now you can see that one in 100,000 is not a high rate to begin with, but still when you're dealing with a lot of vaccinations, uh, this is important. So it was queried uh, more uh, judiciously and a lot of attention paid to it over the years. And subsequently with much more investigation done into the 70s, 80s, 90s, and even into the 2000s, it was determined that this estimation of the relationship between certain flu vaccines and GBS was probably an overestimation. Um, pandemics or epidemics uh, never really uh, had an outbreak um, subsequent to that, so it's difficult to challenge some, some of these, but there was a lot of great epidemiological work. Um, the point of this slide is not for you to read all these different studies, but as you can see, there was many studies performed uh, from the 70s I mentioned into even the 2000s, where it showed that the risk of GBS from uh, the flu vaccine was probably uh, much lower uh, than was previously identified. So perhaps less than one in a million. And Health Canada has actually put out uh, recommendations on this. Uh, one of the main questions uh, being who should not receive the vaccine. But prior to that, this is from the Health Canada website, who should receive the vaccine? So everyone greater than six months of age uh, who has not uh, ha does not have a contraindication to the vaccine should be considered, especially if the following groups that are at risk. So people at high risk of developing uh, the flu-related complications or hospitalization, people of capable of transmitting influenza to those at high risk, uh, those in essential community service and direct contract with uh, poultry infected with avian influenza during culling. So certain circumstances so as you can see here, people that are high risk of developing influenza-related complications, some of these may be patients that are actually immunocompromised or have weakened immune systems because getting the flu in those patients can be very serious. So this is why uh, the recommendation is out there for the flu vaccine in patients with immune neuropathies. And we'll go over the details in a second. Uh, who should not receive the vaccine? So there's actually very few situations where someone should not receive the flu vaccine. One of them is if you have an allergy to any of the components. Some of the components uh, 
uh, are made with uh, egg products, for example, so and some other components. So if there's an allergy to any of the components, this should be avoided. And here's the point that I think is of most interest to, to patients uh, who have had GBS in the past. If someone has had GBS that was thought to be related to the influenza vaccination, then people uh, in that category should avoid the influenza vaccination. But that is a very limited uh, number of patients out there. Uh, and the reason is the relationship between GBS and the flu vaccine, I think has to be pretty solid in order to fit into that category. Meaning not someone who has had the flu vaccine at some point in the past, but really in very close proximity to the development of GBS without any other reasons for it. Uh, and the time frame for that is at the most six weeks after the uh, administration of a vaccine. In those few people that have had that scenario, uh, those are really the only people that should avoid the flu vaccine. And as you can see up at the top, everyone else I think should be considered for the influenza vaccination. Why the timing? Why six weeks? Again, we really um, want to have a very strong relationship that GBS has occurred after the flu vaccine versus many other exposures that can occur. In fact, most people that will develop this, uh, this occurs within two weeks and at the most and at the extreme up to six weeks. And if it occurs after this time frame, it's unrelated to be unlikely to be related to the vaccination. So what does this mean for everyone else? Really, most everyone else with GBS can receive the flu vaccine uh, if, if these conditions are not met. So what about the benefits of vaccination? Mm -hmm. So it's strongly, in addition to Health Canada, also recommended by the World uh, Health Organization for high-risk groups, for the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC, also uh, for those age six months or older and don't have the contraindications. And in healthy adults, it is mod modestly effective in decreasing the amount of influenza-like symptoms. So it's not a perfect vaccine, but it does work. Uh, and in healthy children over the age of two, then this reduces the chances of getting influenza by about two thirds. And a major review of vaccination in children uh, found that immunization seemed to lower the risk of getting, for example, influenza from 18% to 4% and some other vaccines from 30 to 11%. So these vaccines do work and prevent some of the very severe complications that can happen. This can happen in anyone, but in people with weakened immune systems, uh, even more so. So some of the common symptoms you know about on the panel on the left here, fever, cough, sore throat, muscle aches, fatigue, vomiting. But another important thing to realize and has been, again, attention in the media uh, often lately is that there can be very severe complications from the flu, life-threatening uh, perhaps, uh, pneumonia, inflammation, the reactions that can occur. And yes, including GBS or worsening of other immune conditions, just because the immune response you get with the flu is very, very significant and can uh, result in these. So trying to prevent these, I think is important. So what else, what else have we learned in uh, very recently? Some of those, those studies that I mentioned before, uh, as, as mentioned, some of these are uh, really just related to the flu vaccine and back from the 1970s and have been queried in different scenarios over the decades. But uh, there's been an initiative uh, worldwide, many countries, Canada was involved, uh, called the International GBS Outcome Study. Uh, many centers in Canada participated in, it, in this, and this is trying to gather some up-to-date information, not just relying on certain uh, groups that have done epidemiological studies, but really prospectively, meaning going forward, looking at many new cases of GBS to get an updated picture around the world of what, uh, what triggers GBS, what uh, is uh, the natural history of patients with GBS that have or have not received treatment. And one of the point here uh, that I'd just like to make is that most cases of GBS um, really occur with infections. So this is upper respiratory infections, gastroenteritis, and uh, under other uh, with uh, out of many hundreds of patients, almost a thousand and now a thousand plus patients, uh, 14 of those patients had other um, triggers for GBS and amongst those, a few of them were vaccinations, but again, this is quite rare um, uh, as, an, as an actual uh, trigger for GBS. So the inf infections are by far the majority of triggers for GBS occurring about 60% of the time. 
What about vaccinations and CIDP or MMN? There's really not much data on that, um, but uh, there's one Italian study done recently, which also tried to get at antecedent events. These are what's happened uh, prior to someone with CIDP perhaps getting worse or worsening. And again, a lot of these are flu-like illnesses, infections, either respiratory, GI. And in these cases, vaccinations were thought to um, worsen CIDP about 1% of the time. So just like any other uh, immune trigger, uh, including infections, which are more common, uh, you know, G uh, CIDP can theoretically worsen. However, the numbers are very low. So this uh, actual impression from this study was that the study seemed to suggest that antecedent events are unlikely to pay a major role in the risk of CIDP and the keyword there being major role. So all these uh, uh, things can occur. Uh, so people with CIDP uh, can get infections and there can be worsenings of fluctuations up and down. Um, but uh, generally the thought is that uh, vaccinations are safe in patients with CIDP and that could be safely administered. MMN is even more rare of a condition. So there is even more limited information on whether vaccines or other um, type uh, infections can uh, worsen MMN, cause flare-ups. But again, the same principles apply. It's an immune condition. So um, patients can uh, fluctuate uh, and have different triggers that can make their condition better or worse over time. What about vaccinations while you're immunosuppressed? I was talking about these conditions in general terms, but the, uh, and it's important to note that patients with uh, GBS are uh, going forward, their immune system really is not compromised because uh, all patients with GBS really should not be on chronic immunotherapy. You know, if you've had a immune uh, event in the past with GBS itself, but people with GBS are not, uh, for the most part, uh, on regular immunotherapy. So really, we are talking about people with CIDP who can require ongoing immunotherapy, which includes immunosuppression or immunomodulation, which could include IVIG. People with, GV, uh, with MMN, for example, are not as often on the traditional immunosuppressants, such as steroids or other similar things, but are on IVIG often. Um, so uh, how do you deal with vaccines when you are taking one of these uh, agents, perhaps, uh, that leads to either immunosuppression or modulation of the immune system. So the general principle is that live vaccinations should be avoided in someone who is taking immunosuppressants going forward on an ongoing basis. So which are these lab vaccinations? I mentioned them previously. Really, some of these vaccines are actually no longer used or even made. So the concern comes much lower. So an older version of the flu vaccine, which was given intranasally is, uh, fits this category. The older single vaccine, which uh, as of November will no longer be made or available in the United States and similarly in Canada, because there is a newer shingles vaccine, TB, oral polio, measles, and yellow fever. So these are the, the ones I mentioned earlier. Killed or attenuated vaccines are safe to administer, even while on some sort of immunosuppression or immunomodulation. And as I mentioned, there is a few exceptions uh, when someone is taking IVIG. I'll mention that in a, in a second. Uh, and I also added the point that it is re not recommended, in fact, to avoid or miss necessary vaccinations while you're receiving immunotherapy or if you have one of these conditions, if there is no major concerns or contraindications. And the reason is um, there have been reports, uh, some of them are not related to patient choice. Sometimes these things are difficult to access. Um, so throughout the health systems, uh, patients, patient groups, hospitals, clinics, I think there's a big push to try to recommend to patients uh, to avoid missing necessary vaccinations because of a concern that there could be major outbreaks of some of these other conditions uh, if these are avoided. And as I mentioned, without herd immunity, this can spread also very aggressively and this, this is things other than coronavirus uh, that can double how serious uh, people are affected in the community. What about special circumstances? What about travel? So when you travel to certain countries in the world, vaccinations are required. So again, as long as they're not live vaccinations, it should not be an issue. So uh, a lot of this is dependent on which country one is traveling to. So there it's quite important to get recommendations from um, healthcare professionals, your family doctor, travel clinics, uh, 
Uh, but the main concept is that as long as they're not live vaccines and you are not receiving ongoing immunosuppression, then things should be okay for you to take. What about vaccines during an attack or a flare up of CIDP or GBS? Here is where there's not much good evidence, but in general, it is uh, recommended to avoid vaccinations during these attacks because uh, they are immunogenic. <clears throat> they can alter the immune system. Um, so during an actual attack, uh, one would want to avoid that. So the question is, when would it then be safe to restart? And this uh, changes depending on the person, uh, their actual attack and uh, their actual clinical phenotype or their actual clinical experience. So I think this is important to talk to your physician about uh, to see once the flare up or the attack has occurred, usually probably in the order of weeks to months, then when is it safe to restart the vaccinations? What about new vaccines? And here, again, avoiding too much coronavirus vaccines is top of mind for everyone, myself and other professionals. But um, really, we want to be very careful about uh, applying some of these principles to each individual vaccine. Um, because there's still a lot of unanswered questions about this. But the concept is that with the introduction of newer vaccines, there's usually less safety data. Um, so uh, it's important to keep that in mind. And uh, every vaccine is different. How long it confers immunity? Does it need a booster? Um, so what are the safety parameters? This is something that's currently being investigated and I think will be very important to um, keep very close to track on uh, as it becomes available and see how it applies to each uh, patient group. So again, consult your physician with up to the date. Uh, and certainly our patient groups will have comments and position statements on this very soon after they're available. So keep uh, the foundation and other similar groups uh, um, uh, keep uh, track of some of their postings and uh, materials in order for to have this information. Some additional questions and our suggestions. So some now one question that came in prior to the talk, which I think is quite important is, is it possible to receive a vaccine while on IVIG? And again, uh, here, inactivated or live oral vaccines, which are the most, uh, should have no uh, effect from uh, IVIG. There is an exception. And again, this is uh, the, some of these live uh, attenuated vaccines. Vaccine MMR uh, is an exception. Uh, this is not uh, recommended to be used in those patients receiving IVIG or sub Q. Uh, and if one is able to go off of these medicines, it is recommended to wait about a year after the last administration, particularly at the doses that are used for uh, immune neuromuscular conditions like CIDP. Uh, the other exception being the monovalent or the older shingle vaccine. But again, that is not as important uh, or relevant now because this is being phased out or discontinued. Um, so I mentioned that during an active phase or a flare up of CIDP or GBS, one should avoid vaccinations. What are the other scenarios where you might want to avoid vaccinations and discuss further with your physician? Well, one is during an actual infection. So if you're actually in the process of uh, experiencing the flu or another infection, it is recommended to avoid vaccines during this period of time. And it's also recommended to avoid multiple vaccinations together. It's best to spread these out. The exception to that, uh, I think, uh, is travel where a number of vaccines have to be given together. But even in that scenario, I would recommend to talk to your physician or travel clinic and, uh, and try to see what the possibility is to spread out these vaccines safely in anticipation of any trip. And the final point is that we do recognize that many patients uh, know or recognize symptoms of a flare up or development of GBS or CIDP. Uh, and we would encourage if you develop any symptoms after receiving vaccination or after any sort of infection, if you start to feel these symptoms to consult with your physician, head to a doctor to get things checked out and, uh, and get an objective assessment on whether this is uh, at all causing any sort of neurological problem or injury. And finally, uh, we do uh, work together as a medical community, especially those of us uh, managing and uh, helping patients with immune conditions. What are some other immune conditions? Within neurology, uh, myasthenia gravis is another condition that is immune 
uh, that deals with very similar issues with ongoing uh, immunotherapy. Uh, patients with multiple sclerosis, for example, again, also very similar in that it is an immune neurological condition. So uh, all of these groups have um, a strong presence with patient advocacy and have uh, some vaccination related uh, concepts and, and recommendations. You know, if you have CIDP, GBS, or MMN, I would recommend to go to the uh, national and international pages for your particular uh, uh, condition. But just to mention that we do work together, all the medical community to learn from each other and different experiences related to vaccines or other triggers for immune conditions. So to conclude, um, there may be a small risk of uh, increased risk of GBS with the flu vaccine, particularly with the swine flu components um, over time. But as I mentioned, this is quite rare, probably in the order of one in a million. Uh, and this may be outweighed by the risk of actually getting GBS from the flu itself, which is probably much more common, or worsening of your immune condition uh, from the flu itself. So trying to avoid the flu or other similar strong virulent uh, conditions, I think is key. If someone has had the unlucky scenario where they've developed GBS, as I mentioned, usually within six weeks of, of receiving a vaccine, uh, particularly the flu vaccine, Health Canada has recommended in that particular scenario to avoid this particular vaccine, the flu vaccine. And in general, uh, those with CIDP MMN who are actively treated with immunosuppression should avoid live vaccines, particularly some of the ones that I mentioned, uh, TB, oral polio, measles, and yellow fever. Uh, really the intranasal flu and older shingles vaccines are no longer uh, relevant, but are on that list as well. Patients should avoid vaccination during active infections or attacks or flare-ups of immune neuropathies, grouping or batching of multiple vaccines. And if you're actually actively taking IVIG or subcut subcutaneous IVIG or subcutaneous immunoglobulin, the MMR, the measles, mumps, rubella vaccines also should be avoided. And finally, as a general point, patients with immune neuropathies should seek medical advice if medical symptoms similar to a previously experienced neurological condition develop after vaccination uh, within a short period of time. And I would also recommend and encourage everyone to confer with their physician and position statements from patient groups and organizations on advice relating vaccinations, particularly as new vaccines become available, including the coronavirus. So pay very close attention as these, um, this information becomes available. And with that, I'd like to thank again, the uh, CIDP GBS Foundation. Uh, more resources are available on the website and uh, always happy to continue to um, work with them to get all the right information to patients. So thank you very much, Donna and group uh, and uh, look forward to continued interactions. Well, Dr. Katzberg, that was very informative. I've even learned some new stuff here, which is fantastic. And we can't thank you enough for your time. And I'll thank you on behalf of the patients that are going to review this. It's an excellent uh, resource for everyone to see. So again, thank you very much. Thank you, Don. I think we're all learning together and we'll continue to do so. So thank you very much for the invitation. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, please go to our website, which is listed on our page, um, on the page here, uh, to register as a patient or a caregiver and for any information um, that you would like on our services and programs. Thank you again, Dr. Katzberg, for providing this presentation to our patient group.